All right, uh, we want to move on now to uh, another uh, mathematical tool that can help us to, to analyze uh, the turbulence, and that is the autocorrelation. And uh, later on, the cross correlation, which is very um, similar to that. All right, so now consider the following signal. So, as you've seen, the signal that you get maybe looks like this for this one is the velocity. In, in, in a point in, in a simulation. Or if you compare that now with this one over here, while it develops, uh, you see that the function over here is going to change more or less a little bit, uh, wait until it becomes turbulent. So there are some spikes there, but in general, these the motions are not completely random. So if, you, if I pause it over here, if you, for example, see that the, the, the velocity profile over here, the point over here would be somewhat correlated to the point over there. Because if you look at the turbulent structures over there, for example here, there's an eddy over here, that eddy has a certain kind of spatial extent. That means the points that are right next to each other are experiencing something similar. So they're somewhat correlated. Now, the same way if you are looking in time, that uh, if an eddy passes through a point, um, it's not going to be an instantaneous change um, uh, of, that, of that value. It's going to change slowly, or relatively slowly in time. So it's going to be somewhat correlated within time. So and that's why you have a function over here, which looks uh, somewhat with jumping up and down. But still, they are somewhat correlated uh, to, to the previous uh, time step. And that's what we want to analyze now with this uh, autocorrelation. So how can we express that mathematically, that two neighboring points are, are correlated or to, uh, in, within time? For example, that this value is somewhat correlated to this value, that there's a certain gradient that not, cannot jump uh, completely uh, random. So, and that uh, leads us to the autocorrelation. And uh, for statistically stationary flows. Okay, statistically stationary flows means that uh, there's no large changes in time, com except for the turbulent part itself. So that means uh, I'm not increasing the velocity in your channel flow that I've just shown. I'm just letting it run. So it's gone, there's going to be some changes in time, of course, due to turbulence, but I'm not going to do anything else with it. So it's statistically stationary. So the outer correlation is defined as the following. Rho of s is defined as u of t times u of t plus s, the average over it, over u square. Sorry, u square. <coughs> the square over here, outside. OK, so what does it do? Essentially, u of t, uh, so I'm introducing a, a variable s. The s is a time lapse, or time uh, uh, lapse compared uh, to, to your original signal. So the time lapse, or the, 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 the time difference, I'm comparing essentially um, the signal with the signal itself uh, plus a certain kind of time, time difference. So I'm, for example, I'm comparing this signal with with a signal over here. So I have here introducing an S. I'm comparing these two by multiplying them. But I'm doing that not only for one time step, I'm doing it for all the time steps. So I'm going on through this entire signal, comparing these two again with the same S. 
comparing these two with the same S, and so on. So I'm going through the entire signal, comparing uh, the, the, the two signals, or the two points of, within the signal. One is the original T, one is uh, the T plus a, plus a, plus a time lapse S. So and I'm doing it for, for all of them, and doing time average, and then I'm dividing it with the uh, u mean square. This is essentially just to normalize it, just making it uh, just uh, to, to compare it with, with other flows, so I'm gonna uh, normalize it with the, uh, with the u mean square. Okay, so essentially compare a current value in T with uh, a neighboring value in T plus S. Okay. Do for all T and can make an average. Then normalize with u square. So that's essentially what you're doing. So and with that you're getting a measure for the memory of the flow essentially. If the signal is highly correlated, so if the correlation values are large, then uh, the, the, this value, the autocorrelation, is going to be large. If it's small, that means that uh, the, the gradients are very large, so it means it's, uh, it's forgetting uh, the, the, the signal quite relatively quickly. So, for example, if I now plot here rho of s as a function of s, At zero, it's always going to be one. The reason for that is if you put here zero for s, you have you're going to have here u square. U square over u square is going to be one. So the values are always going to be one in the center uh, at, at, at zero. And then we're going to maybe go like this, for example. That means if the time lag is large enough, it's going to be the, the autocorrelation is zero, that means they're uncorrelated. Uh, then they're not, uh, the memory is lost after a certain time. And if you're closer than that, um, uh, then there's still some sort of memory up in the flow, that means this value over here is still somewhat correlated to this one. So this one is, for example, for a slow changing signal, that means If I plot that again, the signal would be when we're looking at this, so it would be just slowly changing. A fast changing signal would have a correlation that looks more like this. It's going to be steeper. That means uh, I'm plotting it back over here, it will be changing more rapidly. So it means this value and this value are completely uncorrelated already. <clears throat> All right, um, so this autocorrelation is another measure to, for example, to tell you how uh, fast the, change the signal is changing. If it's not changing very fast, that means you have some large eddies there that are uh, slowly moving through the point where you're doing this, uh, this measurement. That means uh, your, your signal is more correlated because you have a large structure that moves slowly to it. That means it can, you can also obtain something like um, uh, times and length scale from that. So if you have a, for example, you have a low, slow changing signal, look again the red one over here. Here, that means it's slowly changing. That means you can somewhat define a time scale 
a characteristic time scale for that. And so you can also relate that then to, a, to a certain length scale. And let's do that for the time scale first. So a time scale you can get also from the autocorrelation over here. You see if we have a slow changing signal. Essentially, this uh, slow changing signal means that uh, you're going to have a larger area here below that uh, below that curve. And that's what you're going to use to determine now um, uh, time scale. So you're defining a time scale as Tau, so the integral time scale, tau is going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of rho of s ds. And uh, this integral, if you, if you see it's an in infinite integral, it's, uh, of course there are some correlation functions where, uh, where it would not converge to a, to a single value, but it usually does, so for total inflows. So it usually converges. I'm going to show you in a moment uh, um, an example where it would not converge. So, and this one delivers you a um, characteristic time scale of your flow. So you have the uh, integral time scale and you have the autocorrelation. So now we want to introduce the cross correlation. And uh, where the autocorrelation is comparing the signal with it at itself uh, in, in time, the cross correlation is comparing two um, uh, signals uh, that are uh, related to, to uh, in, in, in space. So we call that here C of delta x, for example, <clears throat> is defined as u of t and x times u of t and x plus delta x. <clears throat> and u of t squared. <clears throat> so we are essentially comparing two places in, sp uh, in time, then in space. For example, if you have here a flow that comes this way, you're having here some large-scale structures, you would like to compare, for example, a point over here and compare them over there, because uh, there is some sort of relation, because you have a large-scale vortex structure, for example, a large eddy that's com coming this way. Um, you want to compare these two, and uh, with that you can, can, can do the same thing. So this one would be then here, the delta x. And uh, I've written here delta x now as a vector, but uh, usually you do that only as a, uh, on a single line, so then, then it becomes uh, quite clear. You can also use it um, here, you're comparing, for example, to uh, the signal with it itself. You can also use it for compare it with, uh, with other things. For example, Let's say you have a flow over here, and you're putting a loudspeaker over there. So you can compare now this acoustic signal using here. One of these values is an acoustic signal. The other one is a flow response, for example, over here that you're measuring. You're measuring here U, and you're measuring here, for, for example, the... the uh, acoustic in, 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 uh, inputs, for example, a voltage. And then you can compare these two and uh, you can find uh, then the, the relation or the, the, the correlation between these two. Alright, so autocorrelation and uh, the cross correlation are useful tools for, for uh, identifying how uh, events within your turbulent flows are related to each other. 